Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Goodreads. Today I want to talk about right from the front box. Before we get into the 12 lead stuff, we do have to cover a little bit of the conduction anatomy and why things occur in the right bundle branch block. So from a 30,000 foot view, I want to focus just on the AV node and down. And so it's important to remember immediately after the AV node, we get this small little segment known as the bundle of Hiss. From the bundle of Hiss, we get that separation to the right and left bundle branches. The right bundle branch block actually initially does make an initial deflection almost back up towards the AV node and then circles back down into the right ventricle. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the left bundle actually separates into two different fascicles. We have the left posterior fascicle, which I'll try to draw as a dotted line. That actually goes on the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And then we also have the left anterior fascicle actually runs along the anterior segment of the ventricle, left ventricle. So just remember the left bundle splits into two, the posterior and the anterior fascicle. And then the right bundle has that initial physiologic deflection up very, very slight and then travels back down towards the right ventricle. So today I want to focus exclusively on the right bundle. So of course, we're going to start with the 12 lead. Here's a 12 lead of a classic example of a bundle branch block. And we can see we get this initial upstroke in V1, and that is known as the R. And then we get this deep S wave, and then we get this next deflection, R prime. And I'll go a little bit more into this, but the criteria to diagnose a 12 lead in a right bundle branch block is an RSR prime pattern in V1 and we get a deep S wave. There also has to be a QRS that's wide greater than 120 milliseconds. So I wanna talk a little bit about why this occurs. So just like in our 12 lead, this is a, a little bit hopefully better of a drawing than what I drew by hand. And hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. But if we see our 12 lead stickers V1 and V6 out here to kind of overlay where we're looking at the heart, we can see that as we follow it along in the cardiac conduction system, hopefully it makes a little bit more sense as to why we see an RSR prime and why we see a deep S wave in V6. So like I said, the initial impulse travels from the SA node from here down the interatrial pathways into the AV node, and then we get into the bundle of Hiss. Now, this is where we start to identify the bundle branch blocks. So like I said, we're going to talk about the right bundle in this situation. So the first impulse, right, like I said, there's a little small physiologic section that comes back up towards the AV node. And that is what's responsible for that initial R wave that we see in V1, and, and I'll, I'll denote it out here underneath, underneath V1. So that small physiologic blip back up is a result of the initial R wave. And then as the impulse travels down the right bundle, it's obviously at some point going to meet a block, but this pink segment traveling down the right bundle is actually what's responsible for the S wave. Now remember, with these electrodes in a 12 lead, any impulse that's traveling towards the electrode is going to equate to a positive, and any impulse traveling away from the impulse is going to be a negative deflection. So as you can see, the green impulse, that first little blip coming up, is traveling towards V1. So we get that first initial upward deflection as the R wave. Then with the pink conduction or the conduction traveling down the right bundle, it's going away from V1, so we're going to see a negative deflection. Now, at some point, there's going to be a block down here, and the right ventricle is no longer going to see any more impulse. But the right ventricle still is depolarized, and it does that because it actually receives the remaining electrical depolarization from the left ventricle. So as the left ventricle gets its depolarization, almost like a wave travels very slowly across the left ventricle, myocyte to myocyte, all the way until it reaches the right ventricle. This is what results in the really wide QRS is because it's an inefficient conduction system. Our cardiac conduction system is much like a freeway, and when there has to be myocyte to myocyte conduction, imagine it's like taking a detour through side streets. You're going to hit stop signs, you're going to hit street lights, you're going to hit traffic. And so the conduction is very, very slow. And this has a name. This is known as left to right myocyte to myocyte conduction. Now, as you can see, this blue impulse actually, to some extent, is still traveling towards the direction of V1. So that, as a result, gives us that last positive R prime deflection in V1. And that's this overall, hopefully, color scheme shows you why we get that RSR prime pattern in V1. Now, in V6, we just flip it around. So a lot of people say that V1 looks M-shaped because there's two peaks. Now, on the other hand, the opposite of an M is a W, right? So... We get this W pattern, if we can make it look a little bit better, just like that. But in V6, we see that W pattern and that initial green wave coming up from the physiologic deflection up is going away from V6. So we see a negative deflection. The, per, uh, the lavender impulse that's coming down there 
is coming towards V6. So we see a positive deflection. And then that left to right myosite to myosite conduction is going away from V6. So we get this very deep S wave going away from V6. So this is the result of why we see an RSR prime and a deep S wave, as well as this left to right myosite to myosite conduction, giving us that widened QRS complex. So the official criteria to diagnose this QRS width greater than 120 milliseconds, an RSR prime in V1, which we covered hopefully, understandable, and then there's a deep S wave in V6. So when we look at the 12 lead, we see another great example. Let's see, R, S, R prime. We have a deep S wave. A lot of people do like to use the blinker method. They say that if you parked your car at the tip of the T wave and you traveled down towards the QRS complex, Whatever your first turn is, if you turn right, then that's a right bundle. So that works in this situation. And if you'll see next week or in the next couple of weeks when we talk about left bundle, it'll be the different. As you come down the T-wave hill into the QRS complex, if your first turn on the QRS complex is a left, then it's a left bundle branch block. If either your first turn is a right, then you get a right bundle branch block. But the official criteria still is RSR prime in V1 and a deep S wave in V6 and a widened QRS. Here's another example, and you can see just an ever so slight R, and then here's an S with an R prime pattern, and then a notable S wave in V6. But once again, you can still use the blinker method, take your car, come down the T wave hill, your first turn is right, so that's a right bundle. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that gives you guys some understanding. I think next week we're going to talk about some clinical context of right bundle branch blocks and what that means. But for now, this is the diagnostic criteria of 12 lead right bundle branch blocks.